Hi, my name is Alex Lifeson. I'm going to talk to you about my guitars. Right over here, I have an ES 355 TD, which was custom made at the Kalamazoo plant. Um, I had it stuffed for a while. Everything on it is stock. I had it stuffed with cotton to cut down the microphonics, but since then I've removed it because this guitar has a little more solidity to it that the 335 doesn't on the same body shape. This is an ES-335 TD. It's uh, a 1968 model, so it's almost 10 years old. So it's almost 10 years old. And uh, this, this is my baby. This is the guitar I've had since I began playing guitar pretty well. Guitar. Yeah, it's a very interesting story, which I won't go into right now. Right over here is a Gibson Les Paul uh, Standard, which I use as a practice guitar something to fool around with in the dressing room. Um, I don't, as far as sound goes, I don't think I, I can get the same sound that I get out of the 335 and the 355 simply because it's a solid body and these guitars are hollow bodies. And with a hollow body, um, I can get a lot more clarity and brightness. Whereas with the solid body, it's, uh, the sound is a lot mushier and, uh, and fatter. And not the way I want it. <laughs> right over here is, I'm, I'm not sure of the, the model number, uh, so I'll just say a custom double neck 12 and 6 string on a, a modified SG type body. Um, this guitar I've had reworked a little bit. Uh, I've had uh, one of the, the new tunematics put in on the lower, on the 6 string, and uh, I've had a modified bridge put in on the 12 string just to get the intonation a little closer which is a very hard thing to do on a 12 string because obviously there are two different gauges once you get into the wound the G down um, let's see right over here is a B45 12 which is the only acoustic 12 as you probably know model that Gibson still makes on order um, and I guess that's it. I have a Dove as well, which is an out that I use primarily for recording. And, uh, and the Epiphone over here in the corner, which has been pretty good so far. Epiphone uh, CO60, uh, which I use on stage with a Barkus Berry transducer as the B4512 has. Um... And that's it. Second release from Signals album, which was out a few years ago, which was very keyboard dominated. Yeah. There's more of a balance this time between the keyboards and the guitar, I think. Well, this goes back to what I was saying about ups and downs with our records. With each record, we try, we, we try different things, different approaches. With Signals, we wanted a different perspective. We wanted to bring the keyboards out a bit. We'd been working with the keyboards for quite a few years, and we felt that it was time to do that. But Unfortunately, the guitar suffered, uh, and looking back on that record, the guitar did suffer uh, quite a bit, I think. Um, on the plus side, I, I learned to be more sensitive to the rhythm section, to Neil and Getty, and uh, it, you know, it opened up doors for me, even though it wasn't satisfying from, from a balance uh, point of view. Uh, Grace Under Pressure, I think, was a reaction to signals. The guitar came it up really front, did, yeah. and it stayed up front for the whole record. Uh, and sort of kept everybody back. Yeah. <laughs> but with this record, I think you're right, I think we've struck a good balance with all the instruments. I don't think any one instrument is lacking in its um, presence or in the perspective of the whole sound. It's quite an ambitious album too, because you've got strings and a choir on there, I notice. Yeah, well, you know, for so many years we, we said, let's not do anything we can't reproduce live on stage. And for 10 studio albums, we stuck to that rule. Uh, this time around, we thought, let's not shortchange any of the songs. Let's develop them to their maximum and, and then worry about reproducing them later. And as it is, I think uh, those fears were unfounded to begin with. I don't think we're going to have any problems with this record. And, and those small little details that may be missing 
can be made up for the energy of a live performance. Mm -hmm. The arrangements on, on the last few Rush albums have been quite complex. Do you ever get lost on stage and play the wrong notes or just do <laughs> completely the wrong thing at the wrong time? Oh yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. often. I, there, are, there are the days where you, uh, your mind just sort of goes away and suddenly you, you turn around and you realize you're in front of all these people when a minute ago you were on a different planet somewhere. <laughs> and that's scary. And occasionally we'll all get lost at the same time and it's man, it's just complete chaos for about three seconds and then we fall back into the song right. for some unexplained reason. But uh, it's a good laugh in the dressing room after the show. I'm sure it is, but it's funny you saying that because Rush have something of a reputation for being a very serious band who tend to scorn the, the kind of cliches of sex and drugs and rock and roll within the lifestyle. I mean, those things are available to you, but Rush tend not to get involved, it seems. You know, we're, we're very serious about our music. We're serious about uh, how we work and, and our quality. And we try very hard to do the best that we possibly can when we make a record and when we write our music. It is a serious thing for us. Believe me, we don't take ourselves very seriously, and we're no different than, you know, any of, of the viewers here tonight. Um, it's an it's unfortunate reputation, I think, that we have that stayed with us, but that's really the only thing it is. It's, it's that we take what we do seriously. Uh, music is very important to us, and we don't fool with it, yeah. but on our free time, we are pretty good fools. But there was a story a while back that you took a, a French teacher with you on the road while you were touring so you could learn the language, which is a very un-rock and roll thing to do after a show. Yeah, okay, well some bands, I, I know, like to spend the afternoon after sound check before showtime uh, drinking and uh, going crazy or whatever. Um, after so many years of touring, sitting around a dressing room waiting to go on, you know, that's really boring and you want to do something, there's not a lot you can do and we thought, well, why don't we learn to speak French, a language? And from there, we can learn to speak Chinese. And then Japanese, it was a big dream. So we called up the Berlitz schools, and they provided a teacher in all the major cities on the tour. And we took, a, you know, an hour and a half of French, which is a second language in Canada. And Neil has a home in, uh, in Quebec. And the part of Quebec that he's in, it's almost 90% it's French. So. It's a handy thing to have. It means you can also speak to the audiences when you come and play in France. Yeah, well, when can yeah, we expect to see Rush, actually? Because you haven't played France, that's true. But when can we expect to see Rush come to Europe this time? Um, it's hard to say. We're, we're only taking a couple of months at a time. In the past, uh, we would look at a tour as being eight months long, and we'd know exactly where we would be in six months, three weeks, two days, and five hours. But uh, this time around, I think we're just going to take a couple of months at a time. Maybe the spring, that's the usual time we, we come over to Europe. Okay, so you're starting in the States in December and maybe here next spring, so we'll look forward Hopefully, to seeing you yeah. there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.